Welcome to the next module in 61C. We are going to dive down to the next level of abstraction and cover the RISC-V instruction set architecture and the RISC-V assembly language. Remember, early in the class we talked about the, the ideas of layering different layers of abstraction to represent complex compute systems. On the top, there is a high-level language and hopefully people have mastered C by now. Below that is the assembly language. Below that is the machine-readable version of the assembly language, which is the machine code. And below that are different implementations of the architecture uh, implemented perhaps as block diagrams that can execute that code. Below that level of abstraction, there are logic gates that actually replace things that are inside these boxes in the block diagram. Logic gates are not the very bottom of the, of the compute stack. They're also an abstraction. Uh, they're built out of transistors. Transistors are also an abstraction. Um, uh, transistors consist of different kinds of materials. They're also wires. And all of them are there to carry electrons and holes. And we can talk about deeper than that, deeper layers of abstraction than that. C is not the highest level language, as we already know. There are more complex things that are built on top of it. There are operating systems, there are productivity languages, there are software frameworks, and this entire world is built, or at least the software view of the world is built on top of that. It is important to point out that there are always well-defined in interfaces between these layers of abstraction. Typically, um, we don't write assembly language code we can, but most commonly it is being produced by a compiler. Um, assembler produces a machine readable code. Instruction set architecture is what defines what will be executed by the hardware. And then there are different layers, different ways of implementing things below that. When we are thinking about the assembly language, we think about the instructions executed by the processor. The basic job of a CPU is to execute lots of instructions. When I say lots, I mean lots. When we speak about the processor um, that is running at a modest speed nowadays of 1 GHz, that means that one cycle in a processor lasts for one nanosecond. And that's approximately a time that it takes to execute one instruction, sometimes more, sometimes less, but let's say of the order of. So each processor will execute one billion instructions per second, and that's a lot. These instructions are primitive operations that CPU executes. They essentially, um, constitute of some kind of an action, like a sentence, where the operations are like verbs uh, applied to operands, which are objects that are processed in sequence. Now, there are many different processor ar architectures out there, and different sets of instructions. Different CPUs implement different sets of ex instructions. Um, a particular set of instructions that applies to a processor or a class of processors is called the instruction set architecture. So when we, you know, there are many known instruction set architectures out there. Uh, the most common that you'll encounter nowadays is the ARM um, instruction set architecture, and it is deployed in pretty much all of the cell phones that are out there in the world, and many, many other things. Very popular is Intel x86 that is um, implemented in uh, uh, laptops, desktops, and many of the of the servers and cloud processors. Um, there is IBM Power implemented in servers as well. There used to be very popular IBM Motorola Power PC that was used in older um, Macs. There is uh, MIPS and there is RISC-V. We're going to be talking about RISC-V in this module and beyond. There is a book that uh, actually it was pointed to me by Dan, um, Programming from the Ground Up. And I'm just going to read a little bit from its uh, uh, excerpt from its review. Uh, the reviewer says here, I found that the key difference between mediocre and excellent programmers is whether or not they know assembly language. 
those that do tend to understand computers themselves at a much deeper level. And this really strikes deep uh, with me. That's why we are trying to cover assembly language such that people really understand how is that software being executed. Also, many of the... Um, I, I had quite a bit of experience with, an, with the assembly language of a particular architecture of olden times. Um, those old computers, like an Apple computer, just came with a basic interpreter. They didn't have really an operating system. Um, and if you wanted to do something other than write code in basic, uh, that was a language of that time, um, you had to write assembly language. For example, I had to write a lot, you know, this was my first computer. I still have it. Not quite sure if it works. It's a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. That was a British type of machine. It was very inexpensive. You could plug it into a TV and just keep uh, coding. It also had a basic, but I really wanted performance out of it, so I had to write a lot of assembly code. Back to instruction set architectures. As the computers were developing somewhere in the 70s and the 80s, there was a trend to try to build more and more complex instructions that led something um, you know, to a division or to a trend of building something that is called complete instruction set architect uh, uh, computers, um, or what's then what, what, you know as a uh, as an acronym uh, known as CISC. There was in the early '80s emerged a, or a little bit earlier than that by John Cock in, in IBM to try to build very simple instruction sets, very basic instruction sets that was picked up and really taken to the full extent by Dave Patterson at Berkeley and John Hennessy at Stanford. Um, the idea there was to keep instruction sets small and simple and make it easier to build fast hardware. So each instruction per cycle would do less, but you would have fast hard hardware and we would be able to execute more instructions in a given time. And then we'll use software to build complicated operations by composing simpler ones. Um, Patterson and Hennessy won. Um, there was a long debate, but they eventually won. And even though there are CISC instruction sets out there, like x86, if you look at the way how the, the processor is built, that is really in the essence of it is a risk engine and these complex instructions are added by you know concatenating simpler ones inside the machine. One would say uh, he who laughs last laughs best. Patterson Hennessy as we know won the Turing Award uh, two years ago. When teaching computer architecture People, you know, both instructors and the students have a tough choice. Instructors in particular need to choose an instruction set architecture to teach the architecture in an architecture class. So the choice there is to try to teach x86, but that's very complex and there is often quite a bit of a pushback by, by students in trying to teach as some subset of x86. Alternatives to that are to try to use some older instruction set like MIPS or an old RISC or to come up with a made-up instruction set. The advantage of teaching x86, you know, whoever survives that class is that then they can run any software on that architecture that they well understand because there is a rich x86 uh, you know, system built out there. But um, the, it's easier to understand older instruction sets or made-up instruction sets but the problem there is there is no really software that you can get to run on that. It's really hard to even get a basic compiler running. So there came RISC V. About 10 years ago it was conceptualized. It really you know, took off in the past four or five years. It is open source and license free. What means there is that anybody can use it. You don't have to pay anybody the rights to use those instructions. 
So it became very popular in both teaching, but it immediately jumped into a commercial world. So we have now a rich commercial ecosystem that builds risk platform processors, but there is a well-supported software stack. So we got everything now. A simple instruction set that can be extended and is being extended, that we can teach in classes, and there is a soft, there is a rich collection of software that will run on it. RISC V comes in different kinds of variants to support from tiny microcontrollers to big computers. It comes with uh, in 32, 64 bit, and 128 bit variants, if you like. Um, that says how big are these words that the uh, processor operates on. 32 bits are 4 bytes that we have seen before, 64 bits are 8 bytes that it operates on at a time. <clears throat> in class we are using 32 bits because, believe me, your projects, um, you know, project 3 is a lot easier to implement when it's 32 bits than um, when it's 64 bits, but the book covers a 64-bit version of the architecture that is called RV64. Our variant is called RV32. Um, it's what we cover in class really fits on one page. <laughs> this is what I'm going to be talking about over the next um, few of these video segments. That one page is the captures the entire arch architecture the definition of RISC V um, and is called the green card that is named after the IBM 360 green card, which was very popular back in the 60s. I actually had an opportunity to program uh, IBM 360 and when I was in high school and used the punch cards and line printers and really understood what does that slash n mean in, uh, in C code. Otherwise it will not return the line if, it does, if you don't put that in. Risk five. You know, just a few words about where it came from and where it's going. Um, it started in summer 2010 to support classes exactly like this one, 61C. It was built for 61C, but also for 152 and 151. Um, but a lot of the instructions that you'll find there are the same instructions that you found in the old Risk one and Risk two in the 80s. As Risk Five project matured, it started getting adopted by industry and it got moved into an open source, um, you know, uh, um, non profit foundation that maintains its open source description. It's called the risk5.org. And there are, as I said, many uh, research projects based on risk5, and there are products that may be open source but may be propri propri proprietary. People say there'll be next year about a billion processor cores built in RISC-V. That is quite exciting. You can read more about the history and the lineage in, on the RISC-V.org page. And um, I'll jump in the next video segment. I'm going to jump into the elements of the architecture. See you there.